Hello everyone, Ian Wishart here at the end of another Take A Pew podcast. You what? Have we finished already? No, Simon. Uh, and that is, of course, dear listener, the moderately likeable Simon Clark. No, this is one end of the recording, and then at the end we've got the other end. Oh, uh, right. You never knowingly make anything less complicated than it needs to be, do you, mate? Precisely. Anyway, do you want to introduce the show this time, Simon? Yes. OK, then. Welcome to another captivating episode of the Take A Pew podcast, hosted by yours truly and the moderately dislikable Ian Wishart. Um... And this time we have travelled to South London and the invigorating borough of St Reatham. I think that's Streatham, mate. Oh, yes, of course. And we've come to uh, Streatham to meet the vicar of Christ Church, the Right Reverend Rob Gillian. Right Reverend? You mean he's one of the people that gets to wear a pointy hat? What? You mean he's a wizard? No, a bishop. Oh, yeah. As well as his vicarly duties, Rob is the bishop for the arts for the Diocese of South Walk. Um, Southwark, mate. Exactly. And following a fair few years treading the boards in Theatreland, he's had a wide-ranging ministry, including stints in the Far East and Australia, as well as, of course, jolly old England. Hmm, sounds interesting. We'd better get on with the show then. This is the Take a Pew podcast with the Right Reverend Rob Gillian. Rob Gillian! <laughs> And here we are, in the rather splendid Christchurch Streatham, which by strange coincidence is the home of our guest today, the equally splendid Bishop Rob Gillian. Rob, thank you for having us, and please, take, take a, a pew. pew. Thank you. Hello, Rob. It's lovely to meet you. Perhaps you could just introduce yourself to our wonderful listeners. Well, thank you. I guess you've already said my name a number of times, so I don't <laughs> think that it's Rob Gillian. I should have retired, really. I'm uh, over 70. Uh, but they have decided that I uh, can have an extra few years. But I think every year they make sure that I'm still compus mentis, but so far so good. I'm married to a delightful lady who we've been married for 48 years, Janine. And my children are Alex and Arthur. Alex uh, lives up in uh, Lincolnshire, Nottinghamshire, and works with special needs mm. young people, which is really fantastic. And my other son is in Australia, in Melbourne, with our granddaughter, and he is a uh, marketing manager for Formula One. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Now, as ever, we're looking forward to getting to know the human being behind the purple <laughs> shirt, exploring some of your favourite things, and discovering just who you would most like to join you at your fabulous Take It Pew dinner party. And of course, getting your help and advice in is it true, your spiritual pearl of wisdom, and my random question. But let's start at the start. Where did life begin for you, Rob? I understand it was somewhere that smelt of Tuesday mornings. I was, I was brought up in good old Norfolk, uh, born in, uh, in North Norfolk. Oh, whereabouts? In a place called Docking. Oh, is that funny? That is funny. Is that right? Yeah, my parents uh, had a place in Docking and we, no. we've been up there a few times. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there you are. Love very very close to Kings Lynn. My dad was the vicar there. And uh, we moved very quickly uh, from there uh, into Norwich. We went to school in Norwich. So good clergy conditioning to, from the start then. Absolutely right. But I think the lovely thing that uh, I will always remember is when I was seven years old and my father asked me what I'd like to do when I grow up. And I said, uh, I want to be an actor. And he said... Follow your dream. That's, Wasn't that wonderful? That's encouraging. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, and then later on, when I was somewhat rebellious about church and uh, faith and so on, which you need to go through that, or some people do, and I said to him, you know, well, tell me a little bit about your faith, Dad. And he said, well, I'll love you. I'll share my love of God with you and Jesus. But in the end, you can't have a borrowed faith. You have to find it out for yourself. And I think that was marvelous advice that he gave me that I've tried to pass on to my children and my grandchildren. <laughs> So I, I take it you had some education at some point, so we have our first regular feature to ask you, which is... What were you like at school? Were you a little bit geeky? Or were you a little bit freaky? Or were you a little bit cheeky? What were you like at school? Yes, Rob, what were you like at school? Well, I, I, I was mischievous, I was... Uh, but one of the things was that I was... You know, I told you at seven years old I want to be an actor, and that wasn't really 
a bit frowned upon at, at school because you're supposed to be academic. You know, it's quite an academic kind of school. But I wasn't interested in that. I was interested in theatre. And um, I actually had a bit of a stutter when I was younger. But when I went on stage, I lost the stutter. And so it gave, gave me confidence. I, maybe it's being confident being other people rather than <laughs> oneself. I don't know. So I used to go off in the evenings to the Norwich School of Dance and Drama. And in those days, one of the reasons I didn't tell anybody was because it's pretty sissy being an actor and a dancer, rather like Billy Elliot. But uh, in my fifth year, they were putting on a play uh, at the school, Noah by Andre Obey, an amusing play. Anyway, the chap who's supposed to be playing Noah suddenly left three weeks before the performance. Barney, a mate of mine, who has since become a film director and producer, by the way, uh, was playing one of the lions in the, on the ark. <laughs> and uh, uh, he said, uh, oh, well, I know Gillian Minor, because my brother was there as well. Gillian Minor, he goes off. I know he goes off to a drama school in secret. So the history master called me in and said, uh, would you please be Noah? And so I had to learn the part in three weeks and went on stage. So that sounds that, like a great big break. And so acad did that, academically, were you? Uh, average. Any, <laughs> any particular subjects that you? English. On? Right. Yeah, really. Uh, I mean, yes, I, I, I did all right. I wasn't uh, a brilliant uh, student. And because I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't into going to university or having high flying, I wanted to be an actor. So as soon as I could, I wanted to get to drama school. Um, and uh, again, Barney's mother, who knew I was really interested in, in, in theatre, uh, saw an advert in the Daily Mail. And it said, actors who don't want to be stars, audition. And it was for the National Youth Theatre in London. So I, as a Norfolk boy, in my, my accent, I went down to London <laughs> and I, I uh, auditioned for National Youth Theatre and uh, I was accepted. So I went down there and so it began a, a, a really exciting wow. adventure, uh, starting in the Youth Theatre and then on to Drama School and then into Professional Theatre. So what age was that at then? Uh, I was seven, 16, 17. Okay. So, yeah. And that brings us to a juncture where we on the show like to look back over those formative years, if you like, and uh, ask you another of our regular questions. <laughs> What's your fondest childhood memory? What's your fondest, what's your fondest of all your childhood memories? What's your fondest, what's your fondest? Oh. <laughs> yes. yes, Rob, what's your fondest childhood memory? Well, I think I, I'll, I'll share you one that I... I'm not sure I remember very well, but my mother told me all about it. <laughs> I was about three, I think, and uh, there was something called the Royal Norfolk Show, a country thing, a rural thing, and we used to go along and Dad used to go to meet the farmers and, and be part of his mission. Um, but I was left in the sandpit uh, while they all went <laughs> off, and um, I was playing around with the sand and stuff, and who should come along but the Queen Mother? And she stopped. My mother then had returned uh, and was looking nervously and uh, she looked at me and she bent over and she said, uh, oh, hello, little boy. Um, what are you doing? Are you making sand pies? And I looked up at her with disgust and said, no, I'm making porridge. And I continued to do it. My mother didn't know what to do with herself. But the lovely thing is, we have a photograph in the oh. Eastern Daily Press of me and the Queen Mother uh, 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 chatting away together. So I thought that, that if that counts as a childhood that's, memory. It's a very, uh, it, very valid It was a lovely one. Event, even if you don't remember it. <laughs> that's so. right, that's right. <laughs> what's, your, what's your overriding sort of sense of feeling around? Well, I, I suppose I loved, I loved imagination, telling stories. I also, uh, my parents were really wonderful, actually. Dad was inspiring. I used to sit at his feet and listen to his sermons. He never had notes. He, he, he spoke uh, really well. But, you know, I was rebellious. I was at one point, I, I want to be a rocker, you know, with a leather jacket <laughs> yeah. and a motorbike. But I couldn't afford a motorbike <laughs> or a leather jacket. So I ended up having a denim jacket with studs on the back and drove a scooter. But there you go. That's the way you have to come down a little. And I would become a mod with me, with me a tiger oh. tail on the back of the scooter for a while. But um, yeah, but I had a, I had a, I had a great. Uh, sounds great fun. It sounds, it sounds. It was a yeah, fun childhood, joyful. particularly in the country and uh, and so on. I have an older brother. There were some sibling rivalries there, mm -hmm. and I had a younger sister. So uh, lots to uh, be excited about. Yeah. And so we got to the youth theatre. 
So yeah. down in London, yep, in late, in late teens. The Roundhouse. We'll pick up the story from there. Well, uh, w w one of the things it said, as I said, about actors who don't want to be stars, and what I loved about it was the fact that we were an ensemble company and that everybody was as important as one another, uh, whether you were taking a lead or whether you were carrying a spear uh, or whether you were a stage manager or whatever. And that I really, I, I reveled in that and enjoyed that. Although I would have liked to be a star from time to time, but there you go, <laughs> kind of everything. And from that to drama school uh, where I met my wife, who was also studying to be an actress. And then in those days, you had to get an equity card and uh, you had to have 42 weeks to be able to get a foot and then you could go into the West End. So I started to write to uh, 40 repertory companies all around the country. I got uh, three replies. <laughs> uh, it was ironic, really. I was called up by the director who was then directing uh, the Little Theatre in Sheringham. So it's back to home. Oh, yes. back to home. It was yeah. amazing. Yeah. So I, I uh, became an acting ASM, acting and assistant stage manager, uh, and uh, played various roles within the repertory company, mostly policemen, I think. I, was, uh, <laughs> I think I got to inspector at one of the plays. Yes. Right? So I was going up in the world. Level of advancement. So, did you, do you have a natural police-like look about you, did you think? Uh, I think maybe it was just because um, nobody else wanted to do it. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing about the... It was week, midweek repertory. That means that you were doing a play from Monday to Wednesday, another play Thursday to Saturday, oh, wow. another play Monday to Wednesday, another one Wednesday to Saturday, and that was for three months. So you certainly learned, you know, never mind um, getting into the part and getting all Brechtian. You just had to learn the work and get on. And it was great. And I wish that more, more and more actors these days would have the opportunity for apprenticeship to learn the craft of theatre. Later on, I was in musicals. So I took the lead in Oklahoma. I was in uh, Annie Get Your Gun. It was the background of the chorister that helped me to, to get into musicals. So I, I, I enjoyed that. I eventually went on to, into commercial theatre. So I toured with some wonderful name. I could name drop a few actors. Well, we're here yeah. now. Well, well particularly the, the guy that really uh, impressed me was a guy called Richard Todd. Mm -hmm. And Richard Todd was with well, the Dambusters, Robin Hood. And uh, he went to America and they said, you know, we can make you a big star over here. And he said, no, the British film industry made me who I am and I want to come back to Britain and serve the British film industry. And he was a Hollywood person. He'd already gone under Robin Hood and stuff. So, but I learned a lot from him yeah. because he was an actor's actor. And I did a few little uh, moments on uh, Tales of the Unexpected, uh, oh, the, the television yeah. series, yes. again, which was from Anglia Television. And that was after I'd done a, a fair amount of work in the theatre. I was accepted for theological college and I needed to earn some money. So I did some of these walk on voiceovers and stuff. So you'll see me in Tales of the right again as a as a policeman rushing across <laughs> or, you know, I came up, you know There's a theme a, emerging. Yeah. Theme yeah. emerging. I'm never forget one of them was we were filming at Newmarket Racecourse. I played a policeman and we, we were racing after some robbers in a car and there was a helicopter coming over and the helicopter. It was all great adventure, you know. And it was on uh, May Day when the main uh, racer was on. And um, <laughs> nobody played a blind bit of notice. They were all just fixed on the horses. They weren't interested, <laughs> which I thought well, was fun. And I met, I met one or two lovely actors in, in the process. Telly Savalas from Kojak. Oh, yeah. Yeah. His comment was, um, I do Kojak and uh, it's an hour program and we do it every week. And we, we take a week of filming and we do it. And, uh, you have 20 minutes of a Tales of the Expect and you take three weeks to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to Telly, uh, uh, quality too. <laughs> <laughs> and then Rod Steiger was in one and he, he thought it was like Toy Town Television. <laughs> uh, and when you see those old, old tales of the expected, we have moved on. But it was it was great fun. Um, uh, so I have done all, all sorts of different work. For example, I, I was a, a mime artist for two years. <laughs> Uh, in a summer season in Jersey. Get that quiet. Yeah. <laughs> well done. Um, uh, so, so that was fun. And I was in cabaret on cruise ships. You know, it's like a rather grand red coat from Butler's, really, yeah. <laughs> doing the, d entertaining all the people in so many different ways. Yes, it sounds, it sounds great fun. And did any, of, yeah. did any of the stardom wear off on you? Were you ever tempted to really go for some big role? I mean, you'd never turn them down if it, if it came. But I was more interested in theatre being a skill, a craft, as I said before. And as long as I was respected by other actors and directors, that's what I wanted to do. I'd have liked to have got a few more um, grand parts and then I could have decided what I, what I do, <laughs> what I didn't do. But I worked. 
I didn't rest very much, uh, but I did other jobs while, because uh, with a family, you can't just sit around waiting for a job to turn up. So I worked at picking up golf balls on a golf range at the night time. And I was a taxi driver out of Luton Airport. And that was a great, that was a great thing. Um, I don't think anybody really wanted to get into my car because the company I worked for was called Terminal Cars. <laughs> 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 you wouldn't want it, would you? Someone hasn't uh, thought that through. Haven't they? thought it through <laughs> as well. But again, it was a great experience observing people, and that's what acting is all about. And later on, I think that's what ministry is all about. Yeah. Well, it sounds like quite a time. So, had God caught up with you at this in your twenties? Was it? When did that happen? In late twenties. Yes. Yeah. I mean, when I was touring, I'd find myself dropping into a church, and my wife Janine, her family weren't going to church at all. But she went to church at the age of seven on her own. And uh, she really had a faith which was, is, and still is wonderful. And I think it rubbed off on me, <laughs> you know, uh, as well as the background that I had with yes, my, my, my dad. Uh, oh, I loved a bit. So I was, I once I was in love with the theatre, nor am I, if I'm going to be mischievous, I'm not actually in love with the church. I'm in love with what the church can do. I'm in love with what the theatre, what the theatre can reveal, uh, how it can be a reflection about life. That's what I enjoy about it. So I slowly, oh, and then when I was doing the mime, and this is when it really happened, I was in, doing the mime, and of course a one-man show, mime show, you're very lonely, you know? <laughs> and so I went off to a place called St. Brellard's, which was a little church, and I went on a Sunday morning and said, said hello to the, went in, and the vicar didn't jump, nobody jumped on me. After service, I went to the back and the vicar was there and he said, hi, lovely to meet you. Um, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm on a three month summer season. And I said, so don't get too excited because I'm not going to be <laughs> here very long. And he said, it doesn't matter how long you're here for, while you're here, you're welcome to be part of this family. And you know that set something off in my mind, having valued the community of the theater, I thought maybe I could bring some of that to the church. And so that was the beginning of the journey where I thought, well, maybe I should uh, audition mm. uh, for the church <laughs> <laughs> and see where I get to. So I then auditioned and uh, they accepted me. So I went off to Theological College at Salisbury and Wells. Okay. Um, Very for, nice. Yeah, for a couple of years and went back to the, the Norwich Diocese. I was one of the first, I think, choristers to be ordained in the same cathedral where he sang, which was rather fun. And I, I um, so I had my first, my first title as I think, in, in, in Norfolk, in okay. a place called East Dereham, uh, and then called down to Richmond in Surrey. Um, to a little a church called St. Matthias on the hill, uh, which has a spire, and um, they wanted to create community. Here we go again. And they said, well, would you like to come and do that? And that was a very, very extraordinary part of ministry there because um, when I got there, I'm not into buildings particularly, I'm into people and ministry and stuff, but I, they didn't tell me at the time, but they, I discovered that the spire was about to fall down. Oh dear. I said, well, I'm not prepared to help to fundraise unless there's something godly going on underneath where the finger of God is. Because I see the spire as a finger, finger pointing up to God. And so we, we started doing community work. I did a dance company, we had a theater, we had a school, we had all sorts of things going on and, uh, and a coffee bar, which we opened up at the front of the church. So it was bigger, but you know, what about this uh, spire? So we had one or two very lovely people living in the parish. And one particular guy who was in the parish was a chap called Sir David Attenborough. So I went along to see him and I said, uh, explained about the church. He says, I like what you're doing. He said, I like what you're doing. I said, I wonder if you, if, if you would like to be our patron uh, of our fundraising. And he said, uh, yes, I will do that. But he said, I don't just want to be your patron. What can I do? What would you like me to do for you? So I said, well, you're very good at narrating things. If I get some photographs of the rotting stonework, would you like to give a talk? So he said, yes, sure. So we wrote a kind of script and he, he read it brilliantly. I mean, he made out, I mean, even the drain sounded exciting. But, <laughs> you know, it was fantastic. And we raised a lot of money, that for 30,000, I think it was, on the first evening. And then he would only have a, his photograph taken if I was with him up the, the <laughs> scaffolding with a big check from, from companies <laughs> and so on. Right. I mean, he really was, you know, he's a legend. Uh, he was someone I'd have at dinner, by the way. Um, oh, right, and yeah. so he, he was absolutely brilliant. At the end of it, it all been restored 
restored. We, we raised a quarter of a million. He came back and did another uh, St Matthias Renewed. So that was a, a great opportunity. Yes, yeah, there there's definitely, as you say, there's a, there's a very strong community theme running through everything so far, isn't there? Isn't so, there? Yeah. yeah. And still today, as we'll, I'm Absolutely. sure we'll come on to. So. Absolutely. Um, and then at some point you were called overseas. Yes, I had a spiritual director called Canon James Robertson, who was the chairman of USPG, which is the United Society for the Propagation of the Gospel. Oh. Uh, isn't that great? I see, even I said that without stuttering, it's didn't very I? very good. Um, yeah. and, Not at all pretentious <laughs> as a name. No, it's uh, but he was a lovely man. And um, at Theological College, just to go back a bit, we had to go on a placement. And they said I needed a bit of discipline, because um, I was a bit adventurous and mischievous so they sent me off to prison and uh, I, I, I worked with Pentonville prison with the chaplain it was mm. brilliant so when I had my session with uh, Canon James he said I've just seen a uh, advert in the Church Times uh, for somebody to go to Hong Kong to be on the staff of the cathedral and to plant a new church on Lantau Island and also, there's a possibility for prison ministry. I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, you know, so I thought, this is ridiculous. You know, I've got <laughs> children of seven and twelve, and we're in enjoying. But uh, it, when God calls, you offer yourself. So I did. I went and auditioned for that too. And uh, and so we went over to, to Hong Kong with the family in on Lantau Island, and uh, we had half a dozen people in a classroom and uh, the church was brilliant. And at the other end of the island was a prison called Shet Pick Prison, and uh, they hadn't got a chaplain. And so I got in a ferry and a bus and went up that to the prison and said, uh, I'm here. W would you like me to serve as chaplain? And they said, oh, yes, please. So I learned Cantonese extremely badly. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so that's where, where that prison ministry uh, came in. But it was an extraordinary experience. To, and they were, it was a high security prison. So they were, most of them were in for life. Uh, and when you're in for life, life means life in Hong Kong in those days. You know, a lack of hope. But there was a chapel in the prison, which they found an oasis where they could come out of their cell. I didn't care what their motive was to get out of their cell. They came to me and uh, we had some amazing experiences. Uh, and some of those I baptized and uh, there was a real ministry in that, in that prison. The, one of the things I remember is the guy said, uh, how can we share our faith in, in, in prison. It was so difficult. And I said, well, you've got time on your hands. What, what about praying? So they formed prayer groups in their workshops and uh, they asked me who needs to be prayed for. And so I would say, oh, well, so-and-so is not very well. And, so, and they would pray. And then in the next week I come back, they said, well, What's the answer? <laughs> they were expecting their prayers to yeah. be, which was a, you know. Not a bad place yeah. to be, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, unbelievable. Yeah. It really was. And when they found a faith, and hope it changed it transformed and i saw i saw guys being transformed and then sharing that faith with others in a dark place it was extraordinary yeah fantastic how rich and rewarding that must have been yeah. yes it was and, and you did some religious broadcasting i think when you were over there yes <laughs> yes um i was invited to work in in radio television hong kong so i said yeah i will what do you want me to do and so they said well we want you to do morning worship on a sunday different churches coming like like songs of praise right mm. uh, and then i want you to do ref they wanted me to do reflections just before midnight that's for the insomniacs <laughs> and uh, a magazine program uh, in, in a sunday evening called new religious news and views around the world so I was able to interview people who came in but going back to Norfolk when I was in uh, Norfolk there was Anglia television and they invited me then all those years ago to go on in those days uh, younger viewers will not believe this <laughs> television used to stop at half past 10 uh, and so I was invited to an epilogue at 10:25. Oh yes I remember epilogues so I did that and then I did th five uh, mimes. So I did uh, mimes on the radio, on the television. I've not done work for radio, but television. Yeah, it works. Uh, so uh, so that was that, that was that. So okay. again, it's it's all about, I suppose, a golden thread. Yes, absolutely. Going yes. through one's life that uh, you pick up these gifts. Yes. You don't know when you're going to use them, but then opportunities come. And you go, yeah, I, I can do that. Yes, so it's great. That it all fits together. But you did come back to London after that. I yes, think, I did. I spent bit. ten years in yeah. Hong Kong. Ninety-seven was the handover. I just stay, stayed on because there was a real fear um, that the prisoners in the prison, uh, who had been given a death penalty but it was commuted to life by the governor, would be sent to China, and maybe they'd been been shot. 
So they were very, very frightened. So I fought for, for them to say 50 years no change, which doesn't just mean economics, it also means the criminal justice system. Um, it's going a little bit that way now, I'm afraid, but then, uh, so they didn't. So came 2000, it was time for me to come home. Right, yes, an obvious, an obvious juncture. Did yeah. you feel that was the right time for you? Did you feel you'd done your... Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And I, but I also was able to offer the work in a prison to a Cantonese Chinese minister, which was great because it was a co continuity that needs to be there. So I came back. Because you ended up in Australia as well. Not you? yet, no. <laughs> yes, no that's, another, that's another three hours. No. Um, <laughs> I came back to be, I don't know how I got there, but I came back to be the Bishop's Officer for Evangelism in the London Kensington area. A uh, great bishop, Bishop uh, Michael. And he, the first thing he did said to me is this, I want you to work with young people, I want you to use your drama, your communication skills, and I want you to go help me to share the faith as a bishop. And he gave me a... A, a double-decker bus, and I'm on a taxi. He gave me a double-decker bus, and he said, I want you to learn to drive this, and I, yeah, and I want you to go out to uh, uh, various schools and uh, parishes, and I want you to take a drama with you. So we got a, an evangelism team together. I uh, drove me bus, uh, double de clutch, 1966. <laughs> it was number 2000, and on the side, it was 2000 years since what? Yeah. And so we went into the schools, uh, we did some drama, some songs, some dance, and all that. It was great fun. And then they came on the bus to watch a video of the cross and resurrection, and then to talk with, with us. And then he said about the secondary and, and, and sixth formers. And um, I had uh, invited a, a few years before that, a gentleman who I absolutely thought was fantastic called Adrian Plass, marvellous writer and performer and entertainer. I invited him to come to our parish, out with all the parishes, and he was brilliant. And he shared with us a story called The Visit, and I was so moved by it that when I got back, I thought, I know, why not get Adrian to write a one man or a play called The Visit? And he said, actually, Robbie said, that's not my gift. I'm more of a storyteller and a raconteur, but he said, here is the story, it's yours. Do you know, what a generous yeah. thing to do. So he gave me this kernel of a, of, of a story and I developed it using um, actors from schools and from parishes. And then in, in the end, it became a one-man show, which I've been touring. Uh, and it, the, the, the theme of it is that I play the part of the Vicar of St. Thomas the Doubter. And the bishop announces that Jesus is coming back and he's decided to come to your parish. And he's going to come next week, probably for evening song, and you've got to make him welcome. And he comes. <laughs> and I play all the part. I play church wardens and buskers on the underground and, and all sorts of people with challenges and so on. And Jesus connects with me. We don't see him. He's just, I talk to him, he talks right. to me. And it's a really wonderful... Sounds uh, great. Are you yeah. still doing that? Then? Yes, I am. Wow. Yes, yes. Okay. I, I do a Christmas visit, which is a two-hour show. Right. Um, and I do a visit, which is an hour show. Yeah. Um, but it's a, a theatre piece that anybody can come to and enjoy. And so, as a Christian, you can bring your mates and your friends with you, and there might be some conversations afterwards. Yeah. At the end of the performance, Jesus, he has to go back, and, and he says, Robbie says, you've changed. And I go, oh yeah, I've changed because I've been following Jesus around. <laughs> Not, you can't follow Jesus unless you change. And I think that's a very important message. Mm -hmm. Evangelism is not about, you've got to turn and then you, no, just follow him and you will get changed, you'll get transformed. So, What well, fun to be able oh, wow. to uh, reuse that and, and mm. basically have so much fun with it. Yeah. Did you do some vicaring in that period as well? Or was it just all uh, the fun stuff? <laughs> well, no, I had fun stuff as a vicar too. No, no, I mean, um, that was three years as a, as a yeah. bishop's officer of evangelism. And then the bishop said, well, I have a, a couple of churches which I'd like you to look after in Kensington. One is traditional, Book of Common Prayer, and the other one is redundant. Um, we don't quite know what to do with it. And he said, well, why don't you take on this project and, um, and do something with it? Be mischievous. Uh, so I did. We organised that the church was just behind Harrods, and uh, it became a theatre church. And we had our own professional theatre company in which we paid equity rates to the actors, founded an opera company. Underneath was a dance studio, with ground floor, there was a little chapel for prayer, there was a kitchen, a sitting room, so it was a home and where they could come and feel that they were at home in the church. And upstairs we had the theatre space and a place where we worshipped together. So it was a wonderful, wonderful package really. I then, Harrods was just on the corner, so I started to invite the staff to come down for a meditation in the week. 
And then they said, why don't you come up to us and be our chaplain? So I ended up being chaplain to Harrods uh, with Al Fayed, uh, who seemed to welcome me and said, well, you, you seem to raise the morale of people and, and, and you're positive. So, uh, so I did that as well. Then after that, the uh, Bishop of London wanted somebody to take on Holy Trinity Sloan Square, which is just down the road. And I said, well, only if I can continue to work with my theatre church. <laughs> Mixing in some quite highfalutin circles then, all the Sloan Square and Harrods and all yeah. that for a, for a Norfolk lad. I, that's right, <laughs> yeah. that's right. And I think the one thing that I find that people are people wherever you go. And I said to the actors, you know, one of the things that we need to do is to give back or give on our talents and our gifts. And I've always wanted to start a youth theatre. And um, extraordinary, I was also on the Penal Reform Committee in London and I went to this little conference and two prisoners were coming from Brixton to talk about what they had been doing in prison, which was actually using Shakespeare. Uh, so I said, well, if ever you need a church to you know, rehearsing or whatever, if you're allowed out, you can come. Well, they were allowed out on license and they came to do Othello. And I met two or three of these wonderful guys, the one in particular, Darren, he was just the best. He, and, and he came to live with us for a while and we went to Switzerland, took him on a conference and on the way down on the vehicular railway, I said, you know, I would love you to be my artistic director of our theatre company. He didn't know what that was, but he said yes. <laughs> <laughs> so he became artistic director and he said, I don't, I've always wanted to have a youth theatre. So, well, there you go. So together with my wife, we founded Intermission Youth Theatre and we welcome youngsters from Brixton and Streatham and Peckham and Hackney all to Knightsbridge. And of course, it's a neutral postcode. So they're able to come with their hoods up and their arms folded, a knife in their back pocket, and slowly they realised that they were safe. And they could take the hood off, they could put the knife, and they could start to feel who they really were. And we introduced them to Shakespeare, and we introduced, introduced them to Faith if they were, if they wanted it. But we just loved them a lot, and uh, didn't like them all, but we loved them. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, we did love them because God, God loves them, and uh, that's gone on from strength to strength. It's very exciting. Yes. And I didn't really want to leave that, but. God called again. <laughs> a priest from Australia came over and he went to he went to worship at St Paul's Cathedral. I happened to be preaching that day at St Paul's Cathedral, first and last time. <laughs> as, uh, as you do. As yeah. you do. And uh, he heard me preach. He went back to Australia and I think about a year later they were looking for an outback bishop. My name wouldn't get out of his head. And uh, he wrote to me and said, I'd like to nominate you to be our bishop in Australia. Oh, this is bizarre, I thought, you know. So I said, all right, well, you can, but don't hold your breath. And uh, I said, but well, did you know that I've just, just been to Australia because my son is out there. Um, and also I said, my grandfather was a priest missionary in the 1920s in Northern Australia. He said, I had no idea. Oh, a lovely really connection. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, it's, it's DNA, isn't it? It's sort of spooky. So I said, well, yeah, but of course, nominate me. So he did, we went over and we um, uh, interviewed, got auditioned again and I was elected unanimously, so there was no choice, I had to go. Uh, so I had a five years of, uh, just under five years. And was, of that, was that your first bishop -ness? Yeah, yeah. So whereabouts was that? In, in it's a lovely diocese called Riverina, which is in New South Wales, mm -hmm. a, a third of New South Wales. The diocese is as big as England, Scotland and Wales put together. Mm -hmm. Small communities who needed to be loved and feel special. But those farmers, those people living on the land were amazingly pioneering still. And then of course I, I worked a lot with the and indigenous Aboriginal communities because they were part of my diocese. Mm. Um, had a wonderful time. Gosh, another, another amazing experience. But yeah. Um, yeah. You said you, so you did that for five years. Did that come to a natural end? Or? Well, I got old. Right, okay. Uh, and, uh, Fair enough. And I really felt, you know, this is, I've done what I've was called to do, so um, I came back. So we find you back here then? Today. Yes, and I thought, well, I suppose I ought to retire now. My son, Alex, with his wife, Sarah, and his two children are up near Nottingham, so I thought, well, I'll go up there and we'll, we'll see what happens. And uh, the B Bishop of Lincoln found me out. Uh, so he, <laughs> he, he said, would you like to come be my assistant bishop? So there you go, back in back in harness. Right. Uh, which I, I <laughs> There's did no for, escape, is there? No, yeah. it's none escape. So I did... Um, and for 18 months, that was my uh, idea, and that was it. And I thought, right now, now I'm, now I'm finished, finished, that's it. Yeah. And then um, I had a call from the Bishop of Southwark. So that's when uh, they offered me this Christ church, but to also to be a Bishop for the Arts, which I am the only Bishop of the Arts in the Anglican Church, um, mm -hmm. which is lovely. I'm an honorary, so I don't get paid for it, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful opportunity to 
to be involved with actors and dancers and, and particularly during COVID, because I arrived here in COVID, uh, that they, they weren't working and they couldn't afford rehearsal space. So I was encouraging the, the churches to open up their churches, if they were big enough like mine were, and to welcome them to come rehearse at a distance uh, or record uh, for free. So that's what I did. So I, we've now we've got the West End Gospel Choir come and rehearse with us here, which is fantastic. And I just wanted to encourage the church to sponsor and support artists and actors. So that's the Bishop of the Arts, no job description, but I've just had to, had to make it. <laughs> well, it's my, just you, isn't it? Really, yeah, it's, making myself, as you say, it's a unique thing is, built for you, really. Yeah, and I've got yeah. a pioneer minister who's a minister for the arts, so I bet you I work with does very well. So I oversee that and encourage her. Yeah, and obviously alongside all of that, you're the vicar of this church, the wonderful Christ Church in Streatham. It's a beautiful church, isn't it? The mosaic, which is at the uh, altar end, the sanctuary, has the, a picture of the nativity, a picture of the resurrection, and in the middle, the road to Emmaus, to the, the break of the bread, lovely. And the congregation here, the community here, it's such a diverse, uh, congregations I'm learning so much from Ghanaians and Caribbeans and uh, Eritreans and Ukrainians they're all here and they're all one family and I think that's part of the with Christ at the center of all we say and all we do they don't let me slow down at all <laughs> I'm, I'm, kept, I'm kept going uh, uh, with the ministry and Janine is very much involved with Diddy Disciples and we have a choir we had a musical director who's only 22 and is an absolute genius so we've got lots of people who've got great gifts to share and um, I'm enjoying it very, very much. Great. It sounds like a great place to be. It is a great place to be, St. Retham. <laughs> well, it sounds like it's been quite a fun ride, to it, say the very least, yeah, this far. Absolutely. And that brings us to the point in the show where we learn through all of your experiences to date, those things that have become your particular favourites, as we rather conveniently play the little game we call My Favourite Things. <laughs> Yes, Rob, a game which itself may become one of your favourite things, which might send us into some sort of inescapable spiral. But in any case, it's very simple. We give you a series of categories and you tell us your favourite thing in each. Yes, and uh, our first category is always your favourite book of the Bible. Oh, that's easy. <laughs> they're all easy. <laughs> no, they're not all easy. Um, I think that the, my favourite book of the Bible is St Mark's Gospel. The reason for that is that when I was preparing for ordination, three months into, before I was ordained, a theatre director came and said, we're doing a festival, a drama festival, and we'd like you to be part of it. And we'd like you to perform St. Mark's Gospel as a one-man show, here we go, um, for, for us. So I learnt St. Mark's Gospel and I performed it on the afternoon of my ordination. <laughs> uh, which is a fantastic, you know, uh, lead up. So that's my favourite for that reason. Very, very understandable. Yes, it's a nice snappy, snappy gospel, isn't it? Very quick. Immediately, yeah. immediately, immediately, yeah. you know. <laughs> I always say to my confirmation candidate, read that first. Have an interval and have an ice cream in between. But it's like a piece of theatre. You go through it and it'll give you the, give you the bare bones of, of an exciting life of Jesus. That's very good. It's creeping up on the rails, Mark's gospel, in terms of yes, flavours, it isn't is. it? Yeah. It is. Yes. yes. Yeah, interesting. Yes. And the letter, the letter that I would have to follow is the letter of James, which tells you how to live it. How to live yes. your faith. It's very practical. Very good, very good. Your favourite field? My favourite field? My favourite field. That's really good, isn't it? <laughs> well, I went to Holy Lands for a conference on rehabilitation through religion, working with the prisons again. And I went to Bethlehem and um, I went to the shepherd's field where purportedly Jesus was actually born there in a cave and not in the yeah. place where the tourists go. And it was full of bottles of rubbish and Coke cans. And I thought, that's where Jesus is. That <laughs> field was where he and the shepherd, that's where he would be. So that's my favourite field. What a wonderful answer. Yeah, that's great. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking of somewhere just outside <laughs> I don't know, Dorchester or something. I don't know. Well, I was thinking Norfolk. Oh, course, course, that's right. yeah. 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 There's that's lots that's of fields in there. Yeah, a lot of fields there. there. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yes. Okay, our third category is uh, always your top five films. I don't know. I can think of five. <laughs> Gosh. Um, yes. Forrest Gump. Forrest Gump. Oh, oh, yes. I love that. Yeah. Um, it's one with Jack Nicholson where he is somewhat autistic and oh get 
as good as it gets. As good as it gets. Oh, he's one of my favourite actors anyway. So, yeah, as good as it gets, because that's really... And Helen Hunt was the other uh, the actress in that. And I, I loved that. Um, I loved any film with Robin Williams in. <laughs> yeah. um, how many have I done now? That's so three. 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 Musicals. Films, yes. musical films I, yes. I rather like. Do you have a particular favourite in, among the musicals? Go back to Oklahoma, maybe. From the I th well, they're re re redoing that, aren't they? But yes, Oklahoma, I, I, I see, of course yeah. I love. And I suppose if I'm going to be really cliched, The Sound of Music, it was, okay. yes, I, I just love it. I just love it, yeah. Very good. That's an, okay. that a right? nice selection there. Um, yeah. not, I don't, there's no, no violence in there, was there really? No. Normally there's quite a liberal spattering of violent mm. films in oh, right. people's no. choices. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I, did like, I, did, I, I did like the James Bond films, mm. But, mm. but I don't think it, they're not that violent no, actually no, in comparison no. with some it's of the stuff we get now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a great choice. Thank you. Now, our penultimate category is in fact eight categories that we call the Great Eight scientifically proven to reveal the true identity of the soul yes Heavens. or mm. maybe not maybe not but here we go eight quick fire categories starting with your favorite author favorite author shakespeare favorite type of food anything italian i love italian food it's very popular italian food it's, it's definitely winning isn't it it's definitely it? Yes. yes okay your favorite television program well, I would tell you what that I used as it shows how old I am. Dixon of Doc Green. <laughs> because I auditioned for Dixon oh, of really? Doc Green. Well, of course I mean, you did. My yeah, police yeah, of course yeah. you did. Yeah, but I didn't manage to get in it because um, I, I, I think because I declaimed too much and the, the producer said, no, no, just, just talk, you know, you don't have to be an actor, just, you know, <laughs> but I don't know why, but anyway, I didn't get it, but that was lovely to, to so yeah, if, that's a, that's a, that's yeah. a lovely. Did you audition for Zed Carls and Softly Softly as well? No, <laughs> no, I, no, I did for... <laughs> You're needing like because it was the same oh, producer as yeah. but no, yeah. Uh, uh, but I, I, I realised that I was uh, really a, a theatre actor rather than a television. I would like to have done more television because you get more money of that. But uh, but there you go. You, you go yeah. to particular no, journeys. That's, that's very good. Dixon yeah. and Doc Green. I don't think that's going to be replicated. No, no, no. I'll be surprised. Unique. Very good. Yeah. Favorite sport. Golf. Yes, I, I love golf. Don't play it very well, but I love it. <laughs> uh, your favourite band or musical artist? <laughs> musical artist, I suppose, would be um, two people. Can I have two? Yes, I suppose so. Go on then. Elvis and Dolly Parton. Uh, Great combination. <laughs> and, the, and the reason, is, one of the reasons is in the Outback, I was invited to a, a music festival in a place called White Cliffs in the middle of absolutely nowhere. And they gathered together some tremendous musicians and workshops and so on. And so I went on a little stone church and uh, this church hadn't really been really a part of the, of the, of the festival. But when I, as the bishop goes, I said, well, we've got a church here. So I invited some of the artists to come and perform in the church at the end of the festival. And, uh, and they said, we've never been asked before. So they did. So we had a wonderful thing. But the, the thing was that the headliner for the music festival didn't turn up, it couldn't come. So the organizers rang a friend of hers and said, are you available because we have a, and he said, yeah, he said, can you come and be you? You know, can you play? She said, yes. She said, would you like me to come in my other guys? I said, what? she said, what's that? He said, I am one of the finest Elvis Presley impersonators. <laughs> so he came and uh, he ended up coming to the church, uh, dressed up in the vestry, uh, dressed in well, a little room with a curtain on it, and uh, eventually came on and sang How Great Thou Art. Oh, wow. uh, in, it, so, and I preached about Elvis Presley, as a, as a, so that was really exciting. And, and, oh, and, and the next year, I preached about Dolly Parton, my favourite <laughs> saint. So there are, those are the two. Those are the two. Great. Holiday destination. Ah. Thailand. Back in Hong Kong, we met two backpackers. They knew that we had a printer and they wanted to print their CV to see if they could get a job. And uh, they joined the church and they got a job in our, in our parish. And they said they've always wanted to, to build a resort. I mean, extraordinary. Bought some land in Thailand and they built this resort in, in a place called Kaolak, which was fantastic. On Boxing Day 2005, it had finished. The investors had all gone to Phuket to wait for the opening the next day. And the next day, the tsunami yeah. hit. Oh, yes. yeah. Wiped it out. I, we were in London. I rang got straight through on the landline. 
in the middle of a tsunami. Wow. I remember listening to the, the horrors they had to go through. And I said, you know, if there any two people who ought to be there with their children, it should be you, because you will create community. You will build the community back. So we did. Built the, the resort back up again, uh, the Sarajan. And we went 100 days after and took some stuff for the orphanages and we uh, helped to build fishing boats for the fishermen. And we've been back once and we're going again in June this year. And my wife was invited to write a coffee table book of their story called The Sergeant. If you go there, you can buy the book and the money will go to the community. So that's my favourite place. A, that's yes. a very good reason for choosing yes. a favourite <laughs> holiday destination. Thank Brilliant. You. Um, okay, your favourite chocolate bar? Well, it's got to be dairy milk. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Cadbury, Cadbury's dairy Cadbury's milk. Cadbury's dairy yeah. milk. Other makes are available, but they're not as good, frankly. No, absolutely. <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's it. Very good. Being a chocoholic. Favourite board game? Oh. If I was really being, being clever, I'd just say chess. But oh. actually, <laughs> that's a fair shout. Yeah, I, no. I, I, I don't play it very well, but I do. I do. I really enjoy that. So yeah, chess. Okay, very no, good. We'll go with that. Now, a final category of my favourite things is always multiple choice. Oh, so I'll give you three possible answers. Oh, dear. Now, you're part, Rob, of the Diocese of Southwark, yeah. in which one of the landmarks, I believe, is Shakespeare's Globe Theatre. Yes. Most fitting, given your past, of course. So we would like to know your favourite globe. So three possible answers. Oh, you're, you're giving me, a, you give the, me answers. To that. That's good, good. Thank <laughs> goodness for that. The mysterious vegetable, the globe artichoke. The mysterious seasonal ornament, the snow globe. Or global warming. Your favourite globe. Well, my, certainly not global warming is not my favourite. Um, <laughs> not with I, your David Atterbury connection. No. Absolutely not. I would say the snow, snow globe. Snow globe. Yeah. I love that. So <laughs> shaking it up and then uh, seeing the snow fall. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think that's probably uh, the right answer. <laughs> uh, and I think that once again, that insight into your favourite things tells a rich story. Not sure where it is, but hey, um, I'm delighted to report that that ushers us up nicely to the social highlights of the show. Because it's the fabulous take a beaut dinner party, the miraculous take a beaut dinner party. The food is quite irrelevant, and some of the guests are hot. It's the impractical, fantastical take a beaut dinner party. <clears throat> <laughs> yes, Rob, it is indeed time for us to take our seats around the possibly Jacobean table adorned with pre-Fire of London silver, fitting grandeur for your fabulous, miraculous dinner party. The usual reminder of the etiquette. Naturally, you share the table with your chosen friends and family, but there remain four empty chairs. Yes, and you have to fill three of those chairs with someone from any time in history, a cartoon character and a non-domesticated animal. And taking up the final chair is a gramophone player, which will play the single piece of music of your choice throughout the dinner. So, Rob, your first choice, the one person from the whole of history that you would choose to join you for dinner. And remember, it can't be anyone who appears in the Bible or any of your family. And it's got to be in history, so it can't be alive. It can be alive. No, it can yeah. be alive. Yeah. So you can go for Sir David if you Can like. I? Yes. You can, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, um, yes, yeah, Sir David Attenborough is uh, someone I would love to talk more with. He would be a marvellous dinner guest. He wouldn't he? Yeah. Wouldn't he, just? And uh, so our task then is to compliment Sir mm. David with a cartoon character. So who would you choose for a cartoon character? <laughs> <laughs> um... Popeye. <laughs> Popeye. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Really. So you'd have a large bowl of spinach. Absolutely. On the table. Yeah. Spinach on the table and uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. A marvellous, marvellous character. It'd be great fun. It's shaping up. Shaping, it's up, shaping up quite nicely. Well. Okay, for the third chair then, a non domesticated animal. Oh, it would have to be a lion, wouldn't it? Ooh. Oh. Aslan, if possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it, would, it, would, it would introduce an element of peril into the dinner party, it would wouldn't it? Having a lion yes, actually it, at the it, table. It, could I tell you a, a story about that? Have you got time for one? I'm sure we have. Yes. Story. Yeah. <laughs> when I was resting and I needed a job, London Zoo had just lo lost Guy, the gorilla, and died. And so they invited me if I would like to come and be the gorilla uh, in the zoo, <laughs> uh, dress up in a, in a costume 
and sit in the cage. So I thought, yeah, try it. So I dressed up as a gorilla and I sat in the cage and uh, I, I, you know, I was, I started, better, better be more like a gorilla. And I got the bananas were thrown in and some fruit and stuff. I thought, this is great. So I thought I better do a bit more than just sit. So there's a trapeze a bit uh, 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 above me. So I grabbed hold of the trapeze and I started to swing. And there were love up, crowds were going. I thought, this is performance again, you know. I'm performing to a great crowd. But unfortunately, I over overdid it. And uh, I, my hand slipped on the, on the uh, trapeze and I sailed over the bars of the blinking cage into a cage of lions. Absolutely terrified. I ran to the bars, I was shaking the bars, let me out, let me out! And one of the lions turns to me and says, shut up or we'll all get the sack. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go, a lion story. Oh dear, I'm now doubting the veracity of all your other stories. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Not, not really. really, no. So a lot, it, is, it is a miraculous party, so we should be able to sub subdue the lion. We would, yes, absolutely. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Hopefully. If you've got a thorn in his paw, we'd be able to yes, do it. Be yes. domesticated in no time. And um, so to, <laughs> to keep all of that assembled company amused, you have one piece of music to play for best part of a couple of hours, probably, isn't it? Well, Bolero, because it goes on and on and on. You know, it's the one that, that they won the Olympics. Oh, the skating, you know, the, yes, the, the, the skating one. Yeah. Again, the reason for that mm. is because when I was a student, I was auditioned for the ballet, Bolero, at the Colosseum. And I played a figure. That means you're a shadow figure in the back. And I was the lead counter to count. And every time I got, I got to 10, I put my hand up and then count again. You know, and I just didn't want to lose the count because it, you know how it goes on and on and on. Uh, but it was lovely. And then afterwards, uh, I was on the side of the stage to watch the Firebird and other other ballets. It was really fantastic. So Bolero, I think, would be. I think so. Bring back very happy memories. Very happy. And also, I was involved with baptizing someone's child who was the makeup artist for the Dancing on Ice. Oh right. And so we were invited to one of the programs. And who should be there but Torval and Dean, who did the Bolero yes. on ice. So that's oh. got to be my favourite piece oh, of music. Great. Oh, it's, it sounds actually, quite, compared with many of our dinner parties, rather delightful, actually. They yes, it, there it? and yeah. Quiet line in the corner of Vels Bolero, keeping his company. Yes, Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Well, we hope you get to enjoy such a dinner party before too long. Okay. It's almost inevitable, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, it's time to take a quick look into the future as we ask you 12 years from now what would you like to be doing or would it mainly be the same or would you rather be canoeing for example it's just an example <laughs> wonderful yes rob what would you like us to be talking about if we were having this conversation with you 12 years from now 12 years 12 years oh, gosh depends on what kind of state i'm in by the way, doesn't it well, well, whether i'm you know well, suffering we'll assumptions on that well, yeah. well, well yeah. Still, i'm still healthy you think yes. that, that will be yeah. um well i would be spending more time on the golf course <laughs> uh, i think um you will presumably be retired by then well, well there, there's a the limit no, to how no, there's no, a, yeah, no. Exactly. Uh, i mean it's a, it'll be the 70 year rule well that's right yes yeah. so uh, i think that i'll still be uh, passionate about um, what the arts can do and hopefully i might be someone who could uh, be a mentor for the youngsters coming on and encourage them both in the theater and the arts but also in ministry so maybe i could be a, an old sage uh, in the corner yeah do you think would... you'd be in this neck of the woods you wouldn't draw back to, back to norfolk, norfolk or australia even or well, they do we, you know it's, it, sometimes they do say that there's a linus blanket you know that uh, is, is where your roots are but because i've traveled so far i don't think i've got that many roots mm. so I, I always say you grow where you're planted uh, so wherever I end up being planted. What I'd like to do, if any, if the Archbishop is listening to this particular programme, is that I think there should be a lead bishop for the arts uh, nationally. Uh, so I would encourage some young uh, bishop to take on that role. That's what I would like to do. 
Wonderful. Well, we wish you every blessing wherever life and the Lord may take you, Rob. And that brings us to the final leg of the show, wherein we find a thing of beauty sandwiched between two rather less edifying creatures. And I don't mean Simon and me, although that would also be true. (laughs) In a moment, Rob would be forever grateful if you could salvage some respectability for the podcast with your spiritual pearl of wisdom. But just before that, it's time once again for the little part of the show that we like to call... Is it true? Is it true? Is it true? Is it true? Yes, is it true? And this time, I do feel like we might be on to something. It has often struck me, as I'm sure it has many people, how poor old Joseph the carpenter has his walk-on part in the nativity and then seems to disappear from the stage completely. However, much later on in the Gospels, there appears another Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea. And this somewhat mysterious character is reported to be wealthy and a part of the Jewish council. But despite this, he not only distances himself from the council's pursuit of Jesus, but he famously looks after the body of Jesus after the crucifixion. And it now seems pretty clear to me that this Joseph and the Joseph of the Nativity is actually one and the same person. Joseph the carpenter perhaps lost his humble Bible credentials by, I don't know, winning the lottery or something, and therefore sidelined in the gospel narratives. But his actions on Good Friday could not be missed out. It was a risk, but he seems to have got away with it. Until you realise that of Arimathea is almost an anagram of I am father, leaving only two letters, A and O, Alpha and Omega, Jesus himself. So, right Reverend Rob Gilliam. Is it true? Is it true? Is it true? Is it true? Yes, is it true? I do love a healthy imagination. (laughs) I think I'll leave it at that. (laughs) Yeah, so we think it's probably, I must admit, I I almost found myself Were you convinced? I mean, just just listening to that. So we think not, we think that's probably, they they, they were two different people. I think so, I think so, but a lovely idea. Yeah, it did did have some merit, but uh, well, thank you for helping us clear that up. That's all right, I just thought I'd better, you know. Yes. It is, uh, it is important to get these things straight. And I think we should consign that theory to the same bin as Dan Brown's books, personally. Absolutely. And with that, I wonder if you would please grace us with your spiritual pearl of wisdom. It's a spiritual pearl of wisdom. I like the idea of a trinity, so I think I'll have three very short things that have meant a lot to me. The first one is that God doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called. And that's a great relief when you're given some really challenging times in your life, uh, that he will equip you if you're called to it. So that's, that's, that's the first one. Two others, God doesn't expect us to be perfect, just excellent. That's my second one. And my third one is, every day is a gift from God. How we live it is our gift to him. It's a spiritual pearl of wisdom. Thank you very much for that, Rob. And that just leaves one thing for us to tolerate before the curtain falls on this particular production. And that is the rather disappointing final act. That is... Simon, what is your random question for Rob? Well, Rob, you've clearly led a rich and varied life thus far including your time in the world of acting. So, my question for you is this. If they were to make a film of your life, which two actors would be the best and then the most inappropriate casting to play the role of Bishop Rob Gillian? That's a quite good question, Simon. They are very good questions, aren't they? Heaven's sake. Um... (laughs) 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 Well, somebody I got to know a little bit um, through some ministry, which I won't go into, um, was one of the actors who played James Bond. 
and his name is Pierce Brosnan. And I'd love Pierce Brosnan <laughs> to, to the smooth, to be a smooth Rob Gillian. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. It's so, a certain look, I think. Yeah. Oh, thank you very well. I'll take <laughs> that. Yeah. I'll take that. But we were we were parallel as, as <laughs> actually when we talked to one another, we were parallel together in London in the drama school, different drama schools. But we were on a on a but, parallel line. He went so up, <laughs> and I went kind of. Down, I suppose, but a lot. <laughs> no, it's Ben Taylor could have. Of course, well, who it knows? Is. It's like sliding doors. He could have ended up being a bishop. And you, yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So that was the person that would. That's, uh, a, that's a good shout. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So like be good. One. Who would be most inappropriate? inappropriate. I would hope Rowan Atkinson, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Bean. <laughs> Yes. I can I can sometimes appear like that I think uh, yeah. because I love mischief and I love uh, you know right, fun, yes. fun. Well, Helen Mirren would be quite inappropriate, wouldn't it? Wouldn't be yes, yes. Well, he was. She was at the same drama school as me. Oh really? Oh, really? Yeah. Of yeah. course she was. Yes, of course she would be, wouldn't she? <laughs> There's just no escape. There's no escape. Really no, no. I've always got an answer for something. Such a cohesive <laughs> circle of life. It's unbelievable. What's going unbelievable. On? Oh. Well, Simon, look, I think you've managed to turn what had the potential to be a landmark piece of box office into something approaching a farce. But in any case, that was... Simon's Random Question. And so, Rob, I'm pleased to confirm that it is time for you to take a bow. It's been great fun chatting with you. Thank you for having us here and for putting up with our nonsense. And above all, thank you for being on the show. Thank you very much indeed. It's been great fun. And dear listeners, thank you for listening. We hope you've enjoyed spending time in the slightly strange world of the Take A Pew podcast. Please like and subscribe the show wherever you listen to it. You can also connect with us on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. We'd love to hear from you. Simon and I will be back with more fun, faith and flights of fancy very soon. But in the meantime, it's Toodle Pit from me. And Tatty Bye from me. Join us again next time as we Take A Pew. Take a pew.